Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has Join me in another round of applause for our state troubadour, Nikita Waller, for that beautiful rendition. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it, it is beautiful to see this room so full tonight, uh, so full of people and so full of memories uh, and of love and of respect for a woman who gave so much to this community. Uh, looking out in the audience, there are elected officials, not just from Hartford, but from towns around. We have council members, former and present. We have former mayors. We have state senators and state representatives. We have constitutional officers, including our own state treasurer, Sean Wooden, who we'll hear from soon, and our state attorney general, uh, William Tong, uh, who is kind enough to join us as well tonight. Uh, we welcome all of you, uh, but I think in the spirit of Carrie Saxon Perry, uh, everyone here is as important as anybody else. And we are grateful for everybody's presence tonight. Uh, a few months ago when we all learned the news that Mayor Perry had passed, uh, it was uh, a shock to so many. And we all uh, send our, our love and thoughts and prayers uh, to her family and to her loved ones and to her closest friends, many of whom are here tonight. Um, it's important uh, that we come together as a community to celebrate her life, uh, to remember all that she gave to this community, to remember the spirit in which she lived, uh, to remember the convictions that guided her service to our community. And so a number of people, uh, and I will name a few, uh, but please know that there are many more who helped to make tonight happen, came together to organize uh, what we hoped would be a fitting celebration of a great life. Uh, so I want to say thank you uh, first to Mayor Thurman Milner, uh, who cannot be with us tonight, uh, but who was certainly with us in spirit and was uh, part of uh, planning tonight from the very beginning. Uh, our State Treasurer, Sean Wooden, City Treasurer, Adam Cloud, City Council Majority Leader T.J. Clark, uh, Greater Hartford NAACP President Maxine Robinson-Lewin, and Superintendent of Bloomfield Public Schools Dr. James Thompson. I also want to give a special thanks to Faith Palmer uh, from my office, uh, who worked very, very hard uh, to make all of uh, tonight possible. So please join me in also a round of applause for Faith. Although I've met her, I was not blessed to know Mayor Perry as many of you were. So I will be very brief, because we're going to hear tonight from those whose lives she touched so deeply. Uh, but what I do know is that the spirit that guided her life is something that we all uh, should not only honor, but try to reflect in our lives every day. That she was someone who believed deeply in community and in the principle that we are all tied together, uh, that 
being tied together means caring for everyone around us and lifting everyone up. And looking back through her first inaugural address, uh, I came upon these words with, which not only struck me as beautiful uh, and powerful, but also just in much, as much in need, uh, that we need to hear them just as much now uh, as we did then. And during her first inaugural address, she described what she called the struggle for liberation, equality, and empowerment through public service, and talked of everyone's responsibility to be part of that. She said, quote, corporate and community together, the grassroots and the newcomers, the homeless and the affluent, we are all irrevocably tied together. Our destinies are intertwined. We survive together or we perish together. And I think the reason that she left such a mark in this city is that for her those weren't words, but those were the principles that guided everything that she did and everything she gave. And so I'm proud to be with you here tonight as one Hartford, one community, to honor a great mayor, a great human being, with a great heart who gave every bit of it to this city she loved. In a moment, we will see a video uh, that Hartford Public Access TV was generous to put together for tonight's event. And following that, we will have a series of re uh, reflections and remarks uh, from uh, both dignitaries and close friends of Mayor Perry. Uh, I will ask those uh, listed in the program to prepare to come up uh, in order. Uh, following the video, it will begin with uh, our legislative delegation to the General Assembly. And finally, let me just add this. Um, there are, of course, many, many people uh, whose reflections on Mayor Perry's life need to be heard. Not all of them can be heard tonight. But we did uh, ask Hartford Public Access TV if they would also stay available afterwards so that everybody who wants to can share your own reflections. And those reflections will be preserved and available at the Hartford Public Library for anyone to see any time, but also for all of Hartford history. Because that's how long we need to honor this mayor. God bless you all. Carrie Saxon Perry, a well-known political activist, civil rights leader, and the first African-American woman elected mayor of a major Northeast city. The people have spoken. The verdict is in. Victory is ours. The people have won. Tonight, we celebrate, but tomorrow we will go to work. Tonight, we learn that the majority of the people of Hartford share our concerns and our vision. Here, I've only been in office about um, eight months, so I would uh, submit to my fellow panelists and to the chairman that I should get points for a couple of things. One, because I am the newest on the block. Second is because I plan to be very brief. So I uh, would like to tell you a little bit about my city. I have a commitment to work on a plan. Mayor Carrie Saxon Perry dances at the People's Ball at the J.P. Morgan Hotel in Hartford. Retiring Hartford Fire Chief John B. Stewart Jr. 
raises his arms in appreciation as Hartford Mayor Kerry Saxon Perry and others applaud him as ceremonies held in City Hall. Hartford Mayor Kerry Saxon Perry receives a lot of mail every day. Here, the mayor reacts to two days worth of mail that has accumulated on her desk in City Hall. Hartford Mayor Carrie Saxon Perry listens and laughs. Mayor Perry gets a hug from a well-wisher during a visit to her election headquarters. Mayor Carrie Saxon Perry gets a birthday hug from Kamisha Janey, age nine and a half from Bloomfield, as her two twin granddaughters look on at the birthday party in her honor at Shepherd Park in Hartford. Perry's mother lived in the elderly housing residence and threw a party in honor of Perry's 60th birthday. Mayor Kerry Saxon Perry smiles and laughs with a young boy and his friends. Everybody. Um, my name is Matt Ritter, for those of you that I don't know, and obviously joined by Senator McCory, and I think there's a couple of the members of the Hartford delegation. I see Representative Vargas and Gonzalez. I hope they'll join us. I'm not sure if there's any others, but if I missed you, please come on up. And Josh, Representative Hall, here he comes. Uh, we're all in this proclamation together. Um, we'll take 30 seconds uh, just to sort of say that uh, I did know Mayor Kerry Perry. Um, I can remember in 1989, 1988, playing West End soccer with a young, uh, ch uh, young friend at the time named Franklin Perry, who many of you know is my best friend in the world. He was the best man at my wedding. He is the godfather to my children. And I've gotten to become very close to that family over many, many years. Um, Mr. Perry, Mrs. Perry, and Franklin's better, better twin, Danaka. Um, but she would watch us play, and she would sit at a park bench. I can remember it so vividly because of the hat, and number two, because she was the mayor, right? And she would sit there, and she wouldn't say a word, but she would clap when Franklin would score. That was the one emotion you'd get out of her. Um, but it really is too bad that we only come together, it seems, for memoriams, for funerals, and for wakes. And there are so many people in this room that have made such an impact on the city of Hartford and the state of Connecticut, whether in municipal government or state government or the nonprofit sector or labor unions. I hope we do it again, and I hope we do it under better circumstances. And with that, Senator McCord. I'm actually, no, I'm going to reserve my comments. I think I'm on the program that, yeah, I'm on later, so I'll say a couple words then. But again, uh, thanks for coming. I'll just say this, so I'll have to say it later. Before uh, I knew who Mayor Perry was, uh, I met her mother. Her mother used to work at Annie Fisher School when I was an elementary yeah, yeah. school student. And this was way before she was elected office, but her mother was tough. I didn't know they had hall monitors in elementary school, but you couldn't do anything in that school without her mom making sure you was right. So I will save that. I want to get that out now, so I'll save my other words for later. Thank you. <laughs> well, I'm not going to say much, but I will, I will say that um, I met her, I met, um, I met her in 1987 when she was uh, running in the primary. And we used to meet in my house until late, uh, 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. And she always asked me for my, uh, to cook the beans and the potatoes with the kielbasa. <laughs> and at that time, at 3 o'clock in the morning, I was cooking uh, the beans for her. So uh, I think she will be missed. Hi, I'm Ed Vargas, and I brought my hat in honor of, of <laughs> Carrie. And I've got to say, what a lady, huh? And a great leader, and I was proud to have served as Democratic Town Chairman under her administration. And I hope you enjoyed the video I took out there. 
of her inauguration in 1987. I had one of those big VHS cameras. They thought I actually worked for a TV station when I showed up. And, uh, but I'm glad I saved it, I, and Bruce Rubenstein uh, had, it, uh, had a copy of it made out there in the lobby, and, uh, and it brought back a lot of memories of all these people that are in this room today, a lot younger than they are now. <laughs> and, uh, and I thank St. Michael's Solution, John Pastorell, for actually bringing it from VHS to DVD. Now it's digitalized and preserved, so uh, you know, thank all of you who were part of that great movement that, uh, that brought a great period to the city of Hartford. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. State Representative Joshua Hall. And just a, a few reflections. Uh, you know, growing up, I just knew her as the, the lady with the hat. <laughs> uh, and, and, and so I went, I went to school in Norfolk, Virginia. And if you ever went to school down south to HBCU and you tell them you're from Connecticut, they don't think people like me live here, <laughs> right? They just think it's nothing uh, uh, but uh, white people are Caucasians. And what I would tell them with so much pride is that, no, no, we had the first African-American uh, mayor uh, in, in New England here from Hartford, and we had the first African-American female mayor here from Hartford. So it was such great pride and joy that I had uh, for uh, Mayor Kerry Saxon Perry. And I grew up on Canterbury Street, and if you know Canterbury Street, uh, there was a political hotbed, right? So we had Chief Stewart, we had Frank Borges, we had I. Charles Matthews, we had so many of these folks who just lived in that community, and so they instilled in me just a, a great care and, and understanding about why, why this is all important for all of us. And I want to thank her for sharing her, her spirit and her, uh, her knowledge with us, so thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm really honored to be here today, and I'm so happy that Hartford is recognizing the service and life of, of Kerry Saxon Perry. Um, you know, a lot of us are probably, if you're anything like me, our image of ourselves is frozen in a time many years ago. Um, I look in, here in the front row and I see a lot of folks that uh, have been through a lot, individually and collectively, in, in representing this city in one way or another, some of us in elective office, others in so many other important ways. But um, I was one of those few that looked like me from the south end of Hartford that supported Carrie Saxon Perry and her team um, that, um, that really broke through a lot of barriers in this city. And when I think about where we are today, it's not easy to put your name out there and to um, put your name before the voters and say, you know, will you accept me, particularly if, if someone looks differently, comes from a different community than what they're used to. And Carrie Saxon Perry did that, and her team did that, and changed Hartford forever. And I was glad to be one small part of that. And thank you all for being here today to honor her. Thank you. So miracles exist. Six members of the Connecticut General Assembly did that in less than five minutes. Don't work that way at the Capitol, unfortunately. Um, but the entire Hartford delegation, and by the way, Representative Bobby Gibson, our dear friend from Bloomfield, is here. Um, and the entire Hartford, yep. And Julio Concepcion um, and Representative McGee as well uh, will be on the proclamation. It just says to the family of Mayor Carrie Saxon Perry, on your passing, a beloved mother, grandmother, esteemed member of our community, as a resident of Hartford, your legacy will continue to live on through the decades of work as a civil rights leader, social worker, President of the Greater Hartford Branch of the NAACP, State Representative, Mayor of the City of Hartford. You constantly fought to break down barriers and raise up others as the first African-American woman to lead a major New England city. Her iconic hats and loving reminders to have a blessed day will be with us always. She will be deeply missed by her loved ones, all of whom she touched with generosity and passion. This fifth day of February 2020, Marty Looney, Senate President, Joy Arasimowitz, Speaker, Denise Merrill, Secretary of State. Thank you. Good evening. So the first thing that Majority Leader Ritter asked me when he saw me this evening is, where were you today? It's opening day at the Capitol. And uh, the governor made his address. And I told him, I've, I've been home, sick, uh, for the last day and a half, in bed. But there was no way possible that I was not getting up to be here this evening.
Scripture tells us that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humbly, generously. In her public life and in her humble death, Mayor Perry carried the generous grace of God till the very end. A public servant in the truest sense of the word, she lived humbly but boldly in service to others. Mayor Perry never wanted a fuss or fanfare, no memorials or monuments in her honor. In fact, this celebration right here is not something that she wanted. And because of that, I confess that I was conflicted with participating today. However, it became clear to me and others that we, the community, we need this. We need our own healing over her loss and we need to ensure that Mayor Perry's powerful legacy be appropriately remembered for posterity because the hefty weight of carrying her legacy forward is upon us. And if I'm keeping it real, we haven't lived up to that responsibility as fully and as fittingly as she deserved. So tonight, I want all of us to recommit ourselves to changing that. This evening is not about a community losing a giant. It's about recognizing the fact that a giant emerged from this community, lived in service to this community, and that she will forever be remembered by this community. So Mayor, I hope you'll forgive us today but you have earned this and so much more. Because yes, Mayor Perry was the first, the first black woman to be elected mayor of the city of Hartford, the first in the state of Connecticut, and the first in a major city in the Northeast. But the mayor's legacy, but I want you to clap harder for what I'm about to say next because the mayor's legacy is not just about the barriers she broke, but it's about the bridges that she built. And let me tell you, she fought tooth and nail to build them. Mayor Perry's credo was fight the good fight. It's a principle that guided her entire life and propelled many of us in this room and not in this room into politics as well. It's something she learned coming up in Bellevue Square when the neighborhood called her Mooney. Raised by strong black women with high expectations, the mayor would recall them saying, quote, when you fall down, you get right up. If you fall down again, get up again and don't be ashamed of falling down. My, how I've used those words in my own life. It was that unrelenting fearlessness to fight the good fight that made her such a formidable leader. Because win, lose, or draw, Mayor Perry was going to be in it. If she failed, she'd get back up and try again. No matter how many falls, she was determined to push back against an unequal system, a broken system. And she made us believe that we had the power to do it too. To the mayor, Power was a tool of influence. It could be used to maintain the status quo or to change it. And she aimed to tap into everyone's collective power to change the status quo. I interned for the mayor while I was a student at Trinity College. And my first job out of college was working on Mayor Perry's 1991 re-election campaign. For those of us that were there, it's hard to forget. But for those who don't remember Hartford politics leading up to the 1990 
one election, let me give you some context. Well, first you have to know that Mayor Perry did not suffer fools, fakes, or idleness well. And after two terms in the mayor's office and little movement by the city council to advance key priorities on issues from health care to the establishment of a police civilian review board, Carrie Saxon Perry, she was one frustrated mayor. At the time, Hartford's weak mayor's strong city council form of government was a particular point of contention. It represented inaction in the imbalance of power, and Mayor Perry was having none of it. Changing the way Hartford was governed meant changing the city's charter, and changing the city's charter required changing the people elected to the council, and changing the city council required bucking the democratic establishment. This was just the type of good fight that Mayor Perry was built for. You see, the 91 election came on the heels of a new census, which revealed for the first time Hartford's population was one-third African-American, one-third white, and one-third Hispanic. So to shift the scales of power and redistribute equity on the council, the mayor not only ran for her own re-election campaign, but she drafted a slate of political newcomers, two black, two white, and for the first time in our city's history, two Puerto Rican candidates to run on her Democratic unity ticket. In a clean sweep, the mayor ushered in a new city council majority and ousted the incumbents in a two to one margin. She never had the money that could buy the political power and influence that fueled the party machine, but she had the people. Mayor Perry always had the people. She was grassroots, a community organizer, years before Barack Obama was born and decades before he made it popular. Mayor Perry was always just years ahead of her time. Back then, critics liked to tag her as a radical because she believed in certain progressive ideals like the decriminalization of drugs or universal health care. You know, things that the insurance capital of the world just really embraced. <laughs> One of my fondest memories, which really does make me smile, was during the 1992 presidential campaign when then Arkansas Governor Bill Clinton was vying for endorsements in Connecticut before the primary. Paul Songus of Massachusetts had dropped out and the choice was down between Clinton and former California Governor Jerry Brown. While the media and party faithful had anointed Bill Clinton the front runner, Mayor Perry wasn't convinced. She had big concerns about him, including his support for the death penalty. So when she was invited to meet with Governor Clinton at Mount Olive Baptist Church here in Hartford, <laughs> naturally, she passed and she sent this kid, me, instead. <laughs> okay, I was in my early 20s at the time. Later, the mayor asked me to tag along with her to the Congress Street Rotisserie. Remember Congress Street Rotisserie? <laughs> to meet Jerry Brown for dinner. No press, no nonsense, just a candidate sitting down with the mayor in conversation. They talked about some issues, and then Brown asked the mayor what she wanted. What would help shore up support for him? He even asked if she wanted to be his Secretary of State. True story. The mayor just shrugged it off with a smile. Now, in all honesty, I'll admit Jerry Brown was a bit out there. But as a Democratic candidate for the nomination, he was challenging the status quo. He was forcing a dialogue within the party, and that was something that the mayor could definitely get behind. Because she believed the po political bosses in dark, room, dark smoke filled rooms don't decide candidates. People do. In the end, Mayor Perry went out on a ledge as the only elected official in Connecticut 
to endorse Brown for the Democratic nomination and worked for his victory. And as it turns out, Brown defied the odds and actually beat Clinton in Connecticut. For Perry, I think she knew he wouldn't be president, but I know she saw it as fighting the good fight by standing by, standing by him and challenging the status quo. What's truly barrier breaking about Mayor Perry was her ability to be comfortable with her choices on the issues, even if they weren't popular at the time. Congressman Charlie Rangel of New York called it her political courage. She was a maverick unbought and unbossed, simply uninterested in playing politics as usual at a table that had no seats for women of color, especially a fiercely independent woman like herself. So she got to work, she built her own table, brought her own chairs, and propped the door open. Welcomed anyone to walk in and sit down. There was always room at Mayor Perry's table. I know I'm well over my allotted time, but before I close, I have to share a story about one New Year's Eve at City Hall. I was itching to get out of the office to start my night when a man came into the office. Now you have to understand, this man was the only thing that stood between me and the evening of celebrations. To my chagrin, I remember the mayor warmly welcoming him into the office. It was brutally cold that night, and this gentleman had no shelter, nowhere to go. So naturally, he came to the mayor's office, right? I remember Mayor Perry picking up the phone, calling all around, well past the time people would pick up their phones on New Year's Eve, trying to find him a safe place to go for the night. And it struck me then, as much as it does now, this gentleman, in obvious need, didn't go to the governor's office or his state rep. He didn't seek out his senators or congressmen. He turned to the mayor for help because he knew she would. That's what she did. To her, public service meant serving the public first, always. To her, connections were important. She'd always reach out and touch your arm in a conversation and naturally knew how to use laughter as a tool to put people at ease. The mayor often made jokes about serious topics. She called it cracking but facking. <laughs> I think that was from Mabel. <laughs> Simply put, Mayor Kerry Saxon Perry was a giant, a civil rights and a human rights icon, authentically Hartford, loyal. She gave herself so generously to this city and to those of us that were fortunate enough to be a part of her life. I have to admit, learning Learning of her loss hit me hard because giants like Mayor Perry are supposed to be immortal. Forever giving us shoulders to stand on. So her home going is really a wake up call and a call to action. It's a reminder that it's on us it's on us to teach our children, and not just our children, but the generations of children about the life and works of Mayor Kerry Saxon Perry. It's on us to fight the good fight, to bring greater equity, not just to Hartford, but anywhere where the scales of power are off balance and the gulf between the haves and the have-nots are just not right. It's on us to humbly follow the mayor's example. It's on us to be of selfless, service to others, all of our sisters and brothers, regardless of their color, their gender, their religion, or who they love or where they were born, it's on us. God bless you. And in the words of Mayor Perry, have a mellow day. Thank you. It is with great privilege and honor that I stand before you tonight and bid you good evening. Carrie Saxon Perry, to whom I have always and will always refer to as 
Madam Mayor. Madam Mayor, my first encounter with Madam Mayor was at a lunch at her invitation and I'm sitting across the table looking at this little tiny woman who was littler than me and I'm thinking, okay, why are we here? She had called me to the table to discuss her challenge sleep. Now, at that time, I was vice president of the Westbrook Village Tennis Association. Happy to be a community activist, going along my business, had no intention of being a politician. I'm just going to say that again. I had no intention of being a politician. Wasn't on my radar screen. Wasn't something that I thought I was called to do. Wasn't something that I wanted to do. Wasn't something that I was happy to do. But Madam Mayor sat there and told me story after story about how hard she was working to make change in the city of Hartford and how much resistance she was getting from the principalities and powers that be. And that is when she got me, because I too believe that challenging the status quo, pushing off the principalities and powers that be, is a call for all of us to embrace. So we had this campaign, and I met Mr. Wooden. That's what I call, I st and today I still call him Mr. Wooden, whippersnapper. I called him, <laughs> such a little whippersnapper. And we had many interesting conversations during that campaign, me and Mr. Wooden. So I became doused in Hartford politics. I knew nothing. I didn't even know there was a town committee, all right? But during that campaign, I began to learn about the inequities in our city about the things that were not right, and about the woman, Madam Mayor, who was trying to turn those things around. So I met new folks, learned new things, and began a life that Madam Mayor gave me. She turned my life around. She put me in a different direction, and I dare say, there are many who sit in this auditorium today who can say the th same thing. Madam Mayor turned our lives in a different direction. <laughs> and in serving with her, her I, I became, you know, like swimming in thoughts all the time about how could these things be? How could we be in this century and still have so many injustices. Carrie Saxon Perry, Madam Mayor stood up for everyone. She was the kind of mayor who went out in the cold, in the dark, under the bridge to look for people to get them in warming shelters. She was the kind of person who stood up against the black church when they were against same-sex partnerships. She was the kind of woman who went uh, on and on about how she had to stay in her place because she thought that that's where God wanted her to be. That was Madam Mayor. Madam Mayor changed my life. And so from here, Madam Mayor, I paraphrase Matthew 25, 21, that says, well done, ye good and faithful servant. I know wherever she is, she is looking at us, maybe not too happy, but I know she understands that we are here because she is and will always be Madam Mayor. 
I have the toughest job of the evening following those two. Um, uh, well, in keeping with what Elizabeth um, call, talked about, I always refer to her as Madam Mayor. And I had the privilege of serving with her on the city council while she was mayor. And she became a dear and trusted friend and mentor. And she was more than that. She was intelligent, wise, compassionate, and someone I learned more from than professors and teachers in fancy places. And she was more than that. She was a state representative for six years and fought hard for her district and all of us in the city. And she was more than that. She was the first African American female mayor of any city, major city and the U, in the US, and she was more than that. She was a fighter for social justice, for the black community, and for all in need in this city and in the world, and a particularly ardent supporter of the anti-apartheid movement. And she was more than that. She cared about young people and for a number of years ran a residence for young women, the Amistad House. But she was more than that. She was fearless when she argued the need for health care, a single health, a, a, single pay, a single payer system for all, and did not back down when the media and the corporate leaders criticized the effort. And she was more than that. When we instituted a civilian uh, police review board and the police had a rally at City Hall where they chanted, we want the hat, we want the hat, she did not back down. And when workers went on strike, she walked the picket line with them. And one time even engaged in civil disobedience in solidarity with strikers. And she was more than that. She gave us all a sense of, yes, we can, si se puede. And she was more than that. She was a devoted daughter to Mabel Saxon, a devoted mother to James, a devoted grandmother to Sidney, Taylor, Barron, and another younger granddaughter whose name nobody can tell me. And more than that, her spirit will live on in all of us who loved her and were inspired by her. And just as she gave us so much, and she wouldn't want to be honored like this, I think we should honor her and name a school or a street or some other appropriate permanent entity in her name so that future generations so that future generations can learn about her immense contribution to our city the state and the country thank you and i kept my the time balance thank you <laughs>
Plan. They just could not understand 
wish to wage, you're still the same by the power of your name. El Shaddai, El Shaddai, Echam Kana Adonai. We will praise and lift you high, El Shaddai, El Shaddai, El Shaddai. Good evening. Thank you for allowing me the several minutes to provide some testimony honoring the memory of Mayor Carrie Saxon Perry. I first had the privilege of working with Mayor Carrie Saxon Perry when we were both social workers. She was working at the Community Renewal Team and I was working at the Capital Region Education Council and later Hartford Hospital. Back then, I did not know her as the hot lady but rather as the resource lady. A group of us social workers readily had available to us her number, and she always took great pleasure in helping us connect clients with housing, food, and energy assistance, something that she herself had always done. Later, I became part of a much larger group of young people who were the beneficiaries of her leadership work, work geared towards developing young talent from within our city, folks who had traditionally not had such opportunities for professional development. I had in my company other young men and women, some of here here today, Sean Wooden, uh, Treasurer Clout, Cynthia Jennings, John Benelli, Elizabeth Horton Chef, Yolanda Castillo, and many, many, many others. She supported me in becoming the city's youngest corporation counsel at age 31 who also happened to be openly gay. Mayor Carrie Saxon Perry understood exclusion. She practiced inclusion and saw the benefits of a multiracial, multicultural society in a dynamic city, so she worked tirelessly towards that end. I must confess that Mayor Carrie Saxon Perry and I did not always agree on all issues. But I also recognize and admit that in the face of disagreement, she did something that is not too common today. She was respectful of differences of opinion. She did not exercise retribution or vengeance for any of these disagreements. And they did not prevent her from, her, from working with you towards reaching resolution of the next issue. Mayor believed in the power of cities, but she was very mindful of the forces that work towards systematic exclusion of oppressed people that serve to per per perpetuate poverty in our city and elsewhere. She was both articulate and vocal, vocal about remedying inequality, and thanks to her, Hartford City Hall began to look more like the city of Hartford. A strong advocate of education, she had to deal with resistance to change and navigate relationships with our Board of Education. Education was, a way, was way too important in her political agenda because she recognized, in the words of her grandmother, that what's in your head, no one can take from you. She spoke at length about the cyclical nature of cities and expressed her deep concern for ensuring that in the next cycle, black and brown people not be excluded and fall deeper into poverty. She wanted all to partake equally in any future progress, most especially where public funds were concerned. 
Her concern over this created several legislative initiatives, which I still think are in effect today. She fought hard to eradicate a certain sense of entitlement amongst those who maintain a posture that they had a, uh, a right to city jobs by legacy, as if those were private property that belonged to a select few and in posterity. And as a gay man, I am very pleased with the groundbreaking work done by Mayor Saxon Perry. As a black woman who knew discrimination and oppression firsthand, she was a pioneer in the fight for LGTB rights. She walked a fine line between entrenched religious beliefs and the positions of a number of churches. In the end, she was successful in working towards creating changes that would afford health and other benefits to the members of the LGBT community. These health benefits came during a time of the rampant AIDS epidemic, and that meant the difference between life and death for many. These changes in thinking and in policy both encouraged and promoted the LGTB community to fight for universal human rights and marriage equality, and also contributed to my own election as the city's first openly gay mayor. So I'm here feeling very thankful that I was given an opportunity to share some words with you today, and I can only ask, as suggested also by my colleague, Professor, uh, my professor, uh, Simmons, that there be some permanent way of memorializing the legacy of Mayor Carrie Saxon Perry, a monument or recognition that is long overdue, that is befitting of a woman certainly ahead of her time, a trailblazer, and a committed public servant who loved the city and expected nothing in return. I sat in the mayoral chair. There are long days and long sleepless nights, days of excitement and accomplishment, but also days of feeling alone, abandoned, and betrayed having to stay positive, smiling, and in the aim, just to be able to say, and in her own words again, have yourself a mellow, mellow day. Thank you. See, I don't have any papers in my hand, so I didn't come with a prepared speech. Um, but I will just say, listening to all the people who came before us, you understand that uh, Madam Mayor was way ahead of her time in her thoughts and ideas of what's best for our community. Um, as a young man growing up in the North End of Hartford, uh, my first time having the opportunity to vote uh, was the vote for Mayor Perry. And you know, in our community, you're taught that, you're told so often that people die for your right to vote. You have to vote, you have to do that, you have to do this. And coming off, and, and, and I've never, I never thought about getting involved in politics. This is not anything I ever wanted to do. Um, but I did vote, I did vote. And I proudly uh, went to, um, Rawson School and pulled the lever for Mayor, Mayor Perry. And, and, and it's so important for people to understand that representation is extremely important for young people. You have to see people from your own community, from your own background, for your own understanding, that speak the same languages as your mom and your grandma and they tell you those same stuff. It's so important for us to see people from our community in those positions. And it's not the position that is most important. It's the work that you do in those positions. And Madam Perry, she did the work. It's, it's evident because of everyone here is today and she touched everyone. And everyone she touched, touched the next generation of individuals like myself. So I thank God for Mayor Perry, for inspiring the people around her who continue to inspire people like myself to want to go in office. And I know I cannot fill her shoes, but I take things from her to fight. And it does get a bit hard. And this work is not easy. Sometimes when we're in the media and all that stuff, but you don't see the late hours. You don't see 
the struggles you have to get people to understand your side of the story and why it's important to work together. What you heard about Mary, Mary Perry, she knew how to communicate. She can work and communicate with the people on the street and the boardroom. And that is so important. And that is probably one of the best skills that I learned from watching her from afar. I didn't work with her individually, but I watched her work and I watched her commitment to this community. And I watch her grow up in this community. And I watch her stay in this community to uplift and improve this community. And that's what I'm going to take from her. That's her legacy for me. And that's the responsibility that I have and everyone else have who are serving the public. Because she served us. She served us. She blazed the path for everyone who come out of the city of Harlem. So if you move from here and go to the state level, remember where you come from. Remember the stories that you were told. And remember representation. And this is not about just her. This is all our responsibility to continue the legacy. And I thank you guys for giving me the opportunity to say a few words. And let's remember, let's remember the work that Mayor Perry did. And remember, it wasn't for publicity. No, it was for uplift. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. I want to reflect on when I first met Mayor Perry. I had just returned home in 1991 on that campaign. I came back home and here's this black woman running for mayor. I've never seen that before. So I volunteered, I worked in her campaign, and we won. But during the campaign, one of the things that she always does for me is she will call me up in the office and, Shirley, I met so-and-so-and-so. -and -so. Please make sure he gets his absentee ballot. Five minutes later, Shirley, I met so-and-so-and-so. -and -so. Please let him get his absentee ballot. And this went on and on and on. She will never, she has never met someone who wanted to vote and always allowed them and give them the opportunity to vote. So let's go forward a couple decades later. Here I am. I'm running for uh, Register of Voters in the City of Hartford. One of the things I learned from Mayor Perry was that if you vote, you empower your community. And by, that's the lesson I learned from her. And that's why I ran for Register of Voters in the City of Hartford. She basically gave me that knowledge to carry it forward. So when, for, um, when I was running for the office, she would call. And she said, you're running for office. But I haven't seen her in decades. How did she know this? She would say, I want to vote for you. OK, say, OK, Mayor, I will get you an absentee ballot. <laughs> I did that. I, she voted. I won, the real, I won the election. And I was registrar for four years. And every election in those four years, she always gets her absentee ballot. She, I don't know how she remember it's an election. And she will call. Don't forget, Shirley, I have to vote. That is the legacy she has left with me. One particular, right after the registrar, couple, you know, forward a couple years later, a young man who um, she mentored was running for office. She calls and she says, Shirley, I need to vote for Sean. I said, yes, Mayor, I'll get your absentee ballot. I don't know how she finds me, but she finds me. <laughs> All right, let's forward a couple years later. Um, I, worked for Governor Malloy. I'm in the governor's office at the state capitol. The phone rings. Um, this is Carrie Saxon Perry. I said, Mayor? She said, yes, I want to vote. <laughs> I said, Mayor, I'm in the governor's office, but I need to go and vote. I said, OK, Mayor, I'll take care of it. I called a dear friend of hers, Paul Bash, and said, Mr. Bash, you need to go get the mayor her absentee ballot. So that is the legacy she has left with me. You have to empower your community, and the only way to empower, empower your community, you have to go out and vote. So everyone here, this is a legacy. I would like everyone to take home, give our children the opportunity to empower their community. She empowered Hartford. She empowered me. She empowered a lot of us here. I walked in this room, and the first thing I said, wow, homecoming. 
This was homecoming. This was a lot of people I haven't seen in decades. So let's not forget that we're home. Harford is our home. And let's make sure we protect it. Make sure we have our kids go out and vote and keep that legacy going. Thank you. Good evening. As a young man uh, growing up in Hartford and attending uh, the Mount Calvary Baptist Church, uh, I remember at one particular instance where uh, I was ushering and I saw this lady sitting in the front seat where the deacons would sit. And I had said, I wonder who that lady is because what stood out from her was the fact of this big hat. And it was bigger than my grandmother's because my grandmother would always wear hats to church. And I see a lot of church people here in the audience. And I said, I know what you're talking. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, so when I would hear the name, well, that's Mayor Karen, Carrie Saxon Perry. I'm like, that's a woman who's a mayor? It's unheard of. But uh, never knew, really never knew her. But I knew of her and I respected her. Uh, I respected her fight. Uh, I res respected her energy. And I respected the fact that she was a trailblazer. Because being, honestly, being black in politics is not your easiest thing to do. Uh, there will be, as I have experienced, lonely times, sleepless moments, trying to figure how things are going to work. But what I can take from her is always keep the fight. And so with that, I'm going to read uh, the City of Hartford Court of Common Council Memorial. And it reads, in memoriam, be it hereby known to all. The City of Hartford Court of Common Council extends its sincerest condolences and appreciations of sympathy to the Perry family on the passing of Hartford's 63rd Mayor, Mayor Kerry Saxon Perry, introduced by Majority Leader Thomas J. Clark II given this fifth day of February 2020 by myself, Councilwoman Shirley Surgeon, and can the rest of the city council members please stand that are here. I want to recognize Councilman John Gale. Thank you so much. So I'm supposed to sing, but I have to tell this story real quick. This is how I met Mayor Perry. Um, I'd voted for her, but I had never met her. And I was working for a temporary agency, and I was sent to the mayor's office to answer the phone at the mayor's office. And Mayor Perry calls into the office, and I answer the phone and say, good morning, Mayor Perry's office, how may I help you? And she says, who are you? <laughs> The rest is history. Um, I ended up working for her. She told me, she said, if you quit working for the temp agency, I'll hire you. And I quit, and for about three years, I didn't get paid, but I believed so much in her. <laughs> but I believed so much in her, I was willing to, to just go with her wherever. Um, I was her driver and I would drive her wherever she went. And um, I do wanna say to Mayor Bronin, the city owes me a lot of money <laughs> because I would drive until midnight, one o'clock in the morning, and she was an exacting boss. I had to be back at work at eight o'clock the next morning, regardless of how late we were out the night before. Um, I loved her dearly, and going into her office was really like going into grandma's office. Um, and so much of who I am today as a pastor is what I learned from her. 
um, things like there's no such thing as a beginning and an ending to your day. And also, if something needs to be done, just do it. So let me see if I can sing. This song sort of really made me think of her. If I can help somebody as I pass along, if I can cheer somebody with a word or song, if I can show somebody who is traveling wrong, then my living shall not be in vain. Then my living shall not be in vain. Then my living shall not be in vain. If I can show somebody who is traveling wrong, then my living shall not be in vain. If I can do my duty as a Christian all, if I can bring back beauty to a world abroad, if I can spread God's message as the master taught, then my living shall not be in vain. Then my living shall not be in vain. Then my living shall not be in vain. If I can help somebody as I pass along then my living shall not be in vain good evening everyone I am Maxine Robinson Lewin president of the greater heart NAACP I am truly honored to be here tonight as we celebrate the life of the Honorable Carrie Saxon Perry. While I did not have the privilege of meeting her personally, I do as her tenure, excuse me, as my tenure began shortly after her tenure as president. We are grateful for her service to the association and to the city of Hartford. We are grateful for her fierceness and willingness to fight for the people of the city of Hartford. It is her shoulders that we stand on as leaders in this community. At this time, before I move on to reading the resolution that we prepare for her, I would like to ask all the members, officers, and executive committee members to please stand and remain standing as I read the resolution. NAACP resolution for Carrie Saxon Perry. Whereas the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, NAACP, was founded on February 12, 1909. And at 110 years old, the NAACP is the oldest civil rights organization in the world. 
And whereas the Greater Hartford Branch was chartered on October 9th, 1917, and as a 102-year organization, we have continually fought for the civil rights of people of color throughout this Connecticut capital region. And whereas the Honorable Carrie Saxon Perry, former mayor of the city of Hartford, former state representative for the 7th Assembly District, served as president of the Greater Hartford Branch for two terms from 2004 to 2008 during which time she was a member in good standing of the association. And whereas member, Madam President entered into internal rest on or about November 18, 2018. Now therefore be it resolved that the Greater Hartford Branch will forward the name of Carrie Saxon Perry to the Connecticut State Conference of NAACP branches located in Hartford, Connecticut, for the inclusion on the wall of falling civil rights activists from throughout the state of Connecticut. And therefore, be it further resolved, the name of Carrie Saxon Perry will be forwarded to the national headquarters of the NAACP located in Baltimore, Maryland for the inclusion of the memorial archives of the 21st century freedom fighters for the state of Connecticut. And therefore, be it finally resolved, the Greater Hartford Branch will observe a 30-day period of mourning for our fallen sister in this never-ending struggle for freedom, justice, and equality. Dated this fifth day of February, 2020. Signed, Maxine Robinson Lewin, President, Shante Brody, Secretary. Thank you. Um, my name is Kevin Doyle. Um, I know some people here, I lived in Hartford and then I've uh, lived in New York for the last 20 years, and I have to say that some of the people I knew 20 years ago, you've gotten to look a lot older, and I'm, <laughs> I'm kind of surprised at that. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm very grateful to be here, and I want to thank uh, Treasurer Sean Wooden um, you know, Sean, uh, I, my phone rang about a month ago, and I saw the caller ID was uh, Sean Wooden. And so I thought, is there something Sean's running for now? Is, he, is there a fundraiser? I said, no, he just got elected. I'm safe. So I answered. And Sean uh, was kind enough to extend this invitation. And I worked uh, with Carrie and the Slate uh, in 91 and 93 in the high times and the low times. Um, but at this point in the program, most everything's been said, just not everybody said it. So I'm going to condense my remarks uh, to say that we've talked about what a fighter Kerry was, whether it was the fight for health care when the insurance industry's hair caught on fire, she took that fight on, whether it was the fight for LGBTQ rights when the organized religion and, and politicians in this city were not up to that challenge, not have the courage to do it, Carrie did it. When she took the step of breaking up the monopoly uh, go along to get along that existed between the Democratic establishment and the Republican establishment and endorsed the third party, People for Change, <laughs> that, that was a courageous fight when she took on the issue of the city charter, when she said, if I'm going to be mayor, give me the authority and hold me accountable. But the people who were pulling the strings behind the scenes were having none of that. Carrie took on all those fights. And the thing is that we celebrate that now. But we have to recognize that you don't have 
those kind of fights and not pay a price. I mean, if you were celebrated in 91 and cried in 93, you know the price we paid. But she was willing to do that. And she was such a dear person at the same time, a fighter and a kind and gentle human being. I, I think like other people here, uh, feel bad. You know, when people would say, what, what happened to Carrie? Where's Carrie now? And people didn't know. And many of us, I think, fell out of touch. And I think correctly, maybe we feel a little guilty about that. Uh, I know I do. Uh, but I hope that by coming together with this celebration, that we can secure Carrie Perry's legacy as a fighter and a leader and a human being. Thank you. Good evening. Let me just break it down. Kerry Saxon Perry was hit. She told it like it was, or as she used to say, T.I. is. So within the two hours that the mayor has allotted me uh, to explicate the life and times of Carrie, I will attempt to include everything that I know. But let me start by asking the Saxon Perry family members to stand. I saw some of them. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. You know, Carrie and I would become family through marriage, but let me just be Carrie. Carrie, lo Carrie loved to hear me say, I cannot transcend time, space, or matter, or perceive the possible incongruities of life. She loved rhetoric. She loved to hear you, as she say, talk that talk. So I'll start by saying, Shalom Alikam. Wa Alikam Salam. Wa Ramatu Alahi. Hutusi Jamba. Habaragam. She loved all of that. It came a time after meeting Carrie while living in the Bellevue Square condominium. <laughs> with Lou Brown uh, that I would become one of her go-to people while a student at uh, Trinity College long before Sean came. But I met her in the Rock Kings Branch Library, do you all remember that? Corner of uh, Avon and Maine. And I was doing something that I just uh, felt was normal. You know, in my walk up, kids were be playing and keeping a lot of noise. So I had to have somewhere to go and read. And so there was a man by the name of George Goodwin. Many of you old timers might recall him. He became the first African American to serve as a writer for the Hartford Current or the Hartford Times. And I used to go to the branch and read Du Bois while I was at 
Hartford Public High School. And so Mr. Goodwin pointed her out to me one day. She was in the library meeting with David Holmes. David became the first uh, president or executive of uh, CRT. And uh, she thought that it was such a great thing that I was reading Du Bois. But I had to explain to her that I was a transplant uh, from North Carolina. And I was accustomed to reading Du Bois and others. And that I just wasn't getting it here. But I was helping myself. We became uh, acquaintances and later uh, friends that she would see me in the condominiums known as Bellevue Square. <laughs> she began to introduce me to others that uh, would help me later in life. And as I said, um, at one point in time uh, in our lives, we were family members. Well, I became a student leader at Trinity. And Carrie would always call and ask me to let her know when dynamic speakers would be there. And so on one occasion, I called to let her know, she was at CRT, that the esteemed political scientist, Charles V. Hamilton, who had co-authored the book, The Politics of Black Power, would be speaking, and I wanted her to come. And she did. She was very enthralled, intensely so, with his presentation. A couple weeks later, she called and asked if I would arrange for her to meet with him privately to talk about politics here in Hartford. Well, I was able to do so. She got Nimlon Adams. Many of you remember Mr. Adams? to drive us to Columbia. And we were all thinking that once we got to Columbia University, we were going to go in and hear all of this knowledge that was going to be expounded. When we got to the office of Dr. Hamilton, Kerry turned to me and Mr. Adams and said, you guys are on your own. <laughs> and of course, being in Harlem, we found something to do for a couple hours. So when we came back on the way back, she was very much uh, into the things that he said about politics and so forth. And she turned from the social worker to the politician. And I thought that that story was interesting for you all because she became so enthralled. She would come up to uh, the institution and sit in on certain classes and so forth. Or come to what we were calling at that time the Black House and sit and listen to students as we expounded and pontificated on all of the things that were happening in those days. And she managed to even get into John Coltrane's Love Supreme. So you know she was going to taste. <laughs> so I just wanted to share that with you. But I'm here stand as a stand-in for Dr. James Thompson. Dr. Thompson's mother went from labor to reward recently. And so he was not able to be here. Thompson uh, was standing in for the Honorable Mayor Milner. So if you would allow me, I will read some of Mayor Milner's statements. Would you do that for me? Mayor Milner says, the following, I deeply regret that I am unable to join you as you celebrate the life of one of Hartford's gifts to humanity, Carrie Saxon Perry. Having recently been released from the hospital, I am now confined and limited in my activities. Tonight's celebration was a must for me, and now it has turned into a must not. But in spirit, I am here in the celebration of life of a great woman 
she committed herself to the welfare and well-being of others. She was caring, dynamic, loving, and dedicated. The Reverend Jesse Jackson affectionately called her the lady, the hat lady. I am sure that Reverend Jackson would have been here had he been in better health. I have known Mayor Perry for most of our lives. We both grew up in Hartford. She inherited the strong will and determination of her mother, Mabel Saxton. During the 1950s and 60s, the late Senator Wilbur G. Smith, Mayor Perry, and I were often referred to as the three musketeers of civil rights, mainly because of our closeness and supporting each other in the struggle for justice and equity not only in Hartford, but in the South. We joined such great leaders in the struggle as the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, a young Jesse Jackson, Andrew Young, and many more. Although the Civil Rights Movement is still ongoing, at the end of the 60s, we made the decision to start fighting for change from within. We never considered ourselves politicians, but this extension in our fight for justice and equality took another direction. Wilbur G. Smith was the first elected as one of the state's youngest state senators. I followed being elected a state representative. And when I was elected mayor, Kerry was elected to fill my seat as a state representative. Then, against the will of so-called Hartford Democratic political bosses, I and others endorsed her, and she became Hartford's 63rd mayor. In closing, I want to thank Mayor Bronin, his staff, for ensuring that the celebration of her life was held for the people that she worked for, cared for, and loved, the residents of the city of Hartford. To each of you who are here, thank you for filling in for me. As Mayor Perry continued to point out, the struggle is far from over. It is going, and it is ongoing. And I hope and pray that each one of you will hold her torch and carry it to the next stop. I close with those words she often quoted and remain dear to her heart. And before I be a slave, I be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. God bless you all. Ma'am Thurman Milner, thank you all for your attention. Thank you to everyone who's offered their reflections. And before Pastor Marshall Montz comes up to give the benediction, I want to thank everyone again for being here tonight and encourage everyone to stay uh, for reception afterwards. There'll be uh, food and refreshments, uh, but most importantly, fellowship. Uh, and I hope that uh, everyone can stick around. And I misspoke earlier, but Stan McCauley will be here filming uh, for anyone uh, who wishes to record their own reflections uh, to be kept at the Harvard Public Library. Um, let me say that in addition to those memories that will be preserved, uh, it's been said a few times tonight that we should honor Mayor Perry uh, with a permanent memorial. Uh, and uh, although we have not determined what that will be yet, let me assure you tonight that we will indeed do that as a community. Uh, At the risk of 
saying less eloquently what was said a lot more eloquently by others. Um, we will, we've honored her tonight. We'll honor her in those reflections that are preserved. We will honor her through a permanent renaming, but most importantly, uh, let's honor her through the work that we do, all of us in whatever way we can. Uh, and finally, uh, let me just say, uh, we, we know that uh, Mayor Perry uh, did not want a celebration or a fanfare. Uh, and so by doing this tonight, we are in some ways uh, disobeying uh, those directives. But I suppose if we're asking her forgiveness, maybe we should characterize it as an act of civil disobedience uh, <laughs> coming from a place uh, of love and a deep conviction that this community uh, wants and needs to honor her. Uh, so thank you all. God bless you and Pastor Montz for the benediction. This has been a great night. And um, I'm just going to ask if we could all stand and if everybody could hold hands for the person next to you. Let's make heart for them. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless thee and keep. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon thee. And may the Lord give thee peace. Amen. Amen. Before you leave, hug somebody and tell them.